Hey everyone. In today's episode, I sit down and I talk with Dave Gerhardt. Dave has worked in marketing for brands like Drift, HubSpot, and Privy. Today, he runs a community of nearly 5,000 marketers called DGMG. We dive in and we talk about ways that marketing leaders can gain influence within their organization. We talk about why companies tend to overcomplicate their brand voice. And we also talk about what it takes to build a brand that's built around a founder's narrative. There's lots of great takeaways in this episode. So let's get into it. So Dave, <laughs> thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for having me. Fun fun fact is we were going to record this earlier, and then I blew out my back, and I had to go to the chiropractor. And now we're back, so I'm happy. I feel much better than we than if we talked the other day, and I'm happy to be here. Yeah, I appreciate that. So I uh, just there's like, sorry, my son just came in, and and he was like like trying to give me cookies and and things. <laughs> no, so, I love it. That's great. Yeah. So. Um, by the way, that actually brings back a memory. I uh, I remember when you I think just started with uh, Privy. You had you know you got into you know doing a lot of the podcasting you know and and sort of getting things put together and you had this clip that you had put out of you and your daughter talking where she was talking about goose poop and <laughs> <laughs> and she and it was like. Yeah, that's it, right? I mean, that's exactly like what you kind of need, I think, in a in a time where we were all kind of locking down and everything at the time. I totally yeah. forgot about that clip. I got to go watch that again. Man. That was the best clip. <laughs> she yeah, she and, came and, in. She came and she's like, "Dad, guess what?" I was like, "On something." She's like, "There's goose poop in the lawn," or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, goose poop. What? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you, what? you were on Amazing. with like a CMO of somebody, you know, a pretty big company, I'm sure, and you know, it was funny. yeah, whatever. But it was, it was pretty awesome. So, but it's it's sort of like real life, right? I mean, at the end of the day, yeah. you know, we're all you know figuring out what that is and most of us have sort of like come to the other side of it we've got either we've sort of gotten used to the new world as it is or or we haven't and um you know things things probably have changed but i but i think what that really i think showed me was that and this is probably my first question for you um is that you know you're sort of real and authentic when you're talking to your audience and you're speaking and you're having a conversation and you're not sort of just that LinkedIn, you know, LinkedIn influencer, you know, that, that sort of sets back and tries to, tries to be the, the expert about all things. And, and I don't think very many people would do that. Right. And, and it's pretty clear that they don't. And I guess my question is, was that surprising to you? Like that, that people yeah. sort of resonated that way, the way that they have with, you know, DGMG and, and everything else over the last couple of years or so? Um, it's only surprising in that, like, I just, I, yeah, I think like, I think the stuff that I talk about and put out is not, a, is not like rocket science and not groundbreaking. And it's, it's just a case study. And like, if you can be someone who has an opinion and yeah. show up consistently, um, you know, I th and I think like, I, I talk to a lot of startup founders and, and others who, don't feel like what they have to say will be interesting to people online. And I think more, more than the authenticity part is like, I've just been blown away by the fact that like me talking about marketing has attracted an audience of other marketers. And I think that's just like a perfect example of one of the values and benefits of using social media in this, in this context is like, you know, if you talk about golf, if you love golf and you talk about golf regularly, uh, the people that are going to follow your stuff, if it's interesting or are, are not going to be, uh, fishers or, 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 or people that make cookies at home and have e-commerce cookie, it's going to be golfers. And I think the same is true, um, with marketing on the authenticity side thing. I just, I've just, I think it's too hard to try to be a character <laughs> and, because then you have to think about like, all right, I'm doing this interview with Eric. I got to be in full character mode right now. And like, that's impossible to know whether you're on or whether you're off. And so um, I've just always kind of felt like it's easier to just um, be myself and 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 show my personality that way, whether that's in text form or or in video, and it just makes for an easier makes for an yeah. easier go of it. And I think there's a great book, um, "Let My People Go Surfing" by uh, Patagonia founder Yvonne Chouinard, and he talks about in that book how uh, for Patagonia they never created some like fictional character for uh, for the brand because he said it's 
it, it's so much easier to do nonfiction than it is fiction. And I, that line is kind of always uh, stuck with me. And I think, I also just think it's a much more relatable, that, that's how people want to interact with each other. Now, it, it creates some people who, who don't like you or don't agree with you or, or don't actually, or, you know, make flash judgments about you and how you might be based on, you know, words that you write on LinkedIn. And, and that's okay. You just have to be okay with that. But yeah, I think um, it seems to yeah. be the right approach for now. Well, I think if you don't have a line in the sand that you draw and you don't create some sort of, you know, dichotomy, right? You know, it's very difficult to, you know, you got to come down on one side or the other, right? And then I think yep. that, that that's part of the audience building piece of it. And, and the authenticity component, it's like, it's got to be real. Otherwise it just falls flat and you don't get the kind of reaction that I think that you sort of want, but you know, people talk about it all the time and it's never like truer words have never been spoken, but stop trying so hard just stop trying so hard and just be you. Right. And that, you know, and as long as you're sort of saying things that resonate, sorry, as my cat comes through, um, you know, there's a, uh, there's just a, there's a, there's a truth in that. So, um, so let's, let's talk about like, just what sort of brought you to where you are. Right. So most people in the audience is going to, they're going to know who you are. But in terms of the, you know, maybe the ones that are not or, you know, they're you know, junior marketers are maybe coming up, um, you know, so you spent time at HubSpot. Uh, I should mention Constant Contact, uh, you know, Drift, uh, you know, you obviously Privy, uh, you know, you, you help sort of come along, you help create the no forms movement, uh, you know, I can sort of go on. But talk to me just like really quickly about sort of when you were in these roles and you were helping to build out the marketing organization, what was sort of the thing that you felt like was the, when you went into it, uh, where you just felt like, I don't know enough and I need to learn and be better at this. Mm, I mean, I still feel, I, I still feel that every day. Uh, so I, I think, um, I, I don't think there was, a, it, it, it's different at each company. And so I think, um, each company you're presented with a different set of like, you know, yeah. you're, you're the chef and you have to deliver a dish and at each cup and, and, and you, you have to do it at each company, no matter what, at 5 PM, we have to make this meal, but at each company you're given a different list of ingredients and a different time frame and a different, uh, you know, in, in a different way you have to do it. And I think the fun part for me is going to each of, has been going to each of those companies and, and seeing what was different. And so like the playbook for what Drift did was entirely different than uh, what Privy did. And so the, the only thing that has saved me was um, learning early on at Drift, just how, just like what, what things I was good at. And uh, David, who's a CEO at Drift, really, you know, pushed me to focus on uh, brand, copywriting, storytelling, product marketing, more of that side of marketing. And instead of like a lot of marketing advice, especially for people early in their careers, like, you know, make sure you're well-rounded, you know, go learn all these different things. And, you know, I was not very, I was not very strong on the math and, uh, you know, analytical and operational side of things. And instead of David being like, you need to, you need to go boost those things or else, you know, you're not going to make it here. He was like, you have the opportunity to be world-class at these other things go he gave me the freedom to like be great at those things and, and really focus and like what i learned was if you go look around all these other marketing leaders they never come up they never all have this perfect you know yeah. they're not 25 percent this 25 percent this 25 percent they might they may have came up through pr they may have come up through product marketing they may have come up through demand gen but it's this kind of ongoing like you got to be an expert at, at at some slice of marketing that you can use but then you start to work cross-functionally and I work really closely with, with all these other teams and you start to observe what good looks like in those departments. And so um, yeah. you have to know where your bias is and where you're strong at. But I, I, I give the example of like when I went to Privy, the very first hire that I made going in was a really, really strong um, analytical demand gen type of person who was kind of like the yin to my yang. And that was the, that was the perfect uh, foundation. And so... Um, that was that was an important learning and just understanding that like you have to be able to 
know what you're not good at, know what the company's not good at. You yeah. have to know what's, what are the right spots to fill and what are yeah. the ingredients that you need to have. Uh, and just kind of always having this like learning mindset. Like we we should always be learning from other companies in our space. We should always be talking to other marketers, marketing leaders and marketing teams, even hosting yeah. a podcast like this, you get some of that stuff. And so just kind of like yeah. that, that, that lifelong learner uh, mentality to, to marketing is really helpful. Yeah. I, I love that because I think it, like the two things that I've sort of learned over the years is you've got to really have a good sense of how to tell the story and get buy-in across teams. Right. And, you know, and then you have to be able to sort of speak the language of your CFO. <laughs> right? Yeah. You gotta, that, you gotta really be one, able to. That, that first one was something that I discounted for a lot. I used to be like, Oh, I'm, I'm really good at writing and storytelling and, and communication, but eh, it's just words. Like I, I got to learn the, yeah. I got to learn the finance and the, the, the operational side yeah. of the business. And, uh, yeah, I, I learned that lesson firsthand of just how important storytelling is across the entire company. Uh, yeah. and, and so often we spent so much of our time in marketing, especially dealing with internal battles as opposed yes. to solving like creative marketing problems. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think, and a lot of I mean, most people will resonate with that, right? They'll, they'll say half my job is just communicating internally, right? Just getting through to the, the, the people in product or getting through to people, you know, that hold the purse strings, et cetera, et cetera. And just getting that alignment. Um, and I, I think that's the, that's the thing that nobody tells you about right is that kind of stuff it, you know when you like when you're thinking about like going into a new position or when you're earlier on in your career you don't really think wow i'm going to spend half my time like spending a lot you know spinning my wheels trying to get buy in from you know from people that are supposedly you know in my own organization <laughs> and and i think the story is what like paves the way right it reduces the friction reduces sort of the entropy that happens in that kind of, you know, in that kind of situation. Right. So I guess that leads to my next question. Right. So in B2B, I'm, I'm sort of thinking about B2B here. Right. So, uh, how do you know when the story that you have created is sort of is, is hitting with your audience? Right. And, and how do you know that, that it's, uh, that it's working, you know, how do you sort of, I don't, when I say attribute, I don't mean like in the, general sense of attribution but like how do you really know that like it's it's starting to take hold well i mean ultimately there there's some uh conversion metrics that you that you should be able to to measure i think it's not a it's not a like um touchy-feely thing it's if you tell a better story that's more impactful and more meaningful more people are going to show up on your website more people are going to sign up for your trial more people are going to request a demo more people are going to buy ultimately it's about making it easier for people to buy the story is not just some like thing that you measure uh separately and so i would look to measure that by what what's the ultimate business result that we're that we're trying to achieve through through this story um that's number one no doubt i don't think people are doing it just for just for fun uh it should be we want to sell more widgets we need to tell a better story about widgets are we selling more widgets right um but on yep. top of that, you also get a lot of um, more qualitative feedback. And so you get more emails from customers telling you how much they resonated with your story or like your product or like this experience. Or you start a podcast and you start to, you know, you, you build a really loyal audience or more people are subscribing to your newsletter uh, and, and, writing in, and writing in comments. Like it, your, your story has a way of when you tell the right story, people have a way of telling you and you don't, it's not so much about like we're seeking this thing out, but like since, you know, I felt this firsthand at Drift, for example, where when we created this movement, this, this conversational marketing thing, we started to get every day I would come into work and my inbox would be two, three messages from marketers who were like, Hey, I read your blog post about this. I totally feel this. I like th that's not something that I can perfectly attribute and like measure over time. But like I'm sharing those screenshots around with the team. Be like, this is, this is amazing. Like this, person who's our who's a dream customer from another company emailed me to tell me that she listened to our podcast and totally believed in how we laid it out like you get a handful of those things over time that you you know you mix with the with the uh the quantitative stuff to get a sense for 
wow, this, this story is really landing. And, and the story is very personal, often very personal for the people that, that you're selling to. Even if you're not selling a very emotional thing, like you're selling marketing software, you're still selling to people who have jobs and who might be stressed out or frustrated at their jobs or want time back. And so you're still working with people who are going to be like, oh my God, I've been waiting for somebody to do this. Thank you so much. Or I totally agree with your perspective in this article. You're, you're going to hear from them in addition to the, the actual data that you're getting. Yeah. So I, I uh, there are so many things I want to say, like to unpack that. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's, there's the, there's the qualitative part of sharing what's working and what's resonating with your, with your audience or with your customers that you can, as a marketer use to be able to sort of, for lack of a better word, sort of chop up, tell, like create a story out of it and drip it out to executives, right? That's one of those things that you can do to be able to, you know, have for that internal communication and buy-in. And then I think, you know, the fact that you started out with, well, storytelling in and of itself isn't the thing, right? It's the outcome, right? It's the business outcome and there should be able to tie it back to some sort of conversion metric, et cetera, which that's sort of my background is, you know, I, I sort of grew up in testing and optimization and, you know, uh, and, and so, you know, when I think about numbers, the being able to communicate as a marketer, I think that's one of the things that I, when I talk to marketers all the time, what I, what I typically get back is I don't know how to communicate what it is that, you know, my campaigns that I'm running right now, when I'm in a meeting, when I'm, when I'm talking to this, let's call it the CFO and I start talking about campaign metrics and I talk about, you know, improvements and whatever, their eyes start to glaze over. Right. And, and that happens so often. I see it in like digital marketing agencies that lose clients because they can't tie to, you know, the, what they're actually producing. Like, you know, I see it with marketers who are not yet able to sort of communicate that way to, to a decision maker. Um, and I use the CFO I, and really, I really kind of put it all under an umbrella of non-marketing executives, right? So anybody who's a non-marketing executive, you know, needs to be able to understand, like, how is this thing that you are doing, this campaign that you are running actually tying to, let's call it pipeline and an actual revenue, or, you know, if you're a B2B company, let's, you know, close one deals, right? So, so I, I think I want to like, maybe drill in one more into that, yeah. right? So there, like, you've worked, you've worked in organizations where you've had a sales team, you, you know, you were, you know, you were part of the marketing team, and you are responsible for helping to create pipeline and ultimately get alignment. So what was the thing that you sort of did that you felt like was like the thing that really helped? Well, like in, in, maybe, in that example, I mean, the answer could be maybe in, in, in right? that example, I'm like, just kind of curious. I think, I think there's a, there's a couple, there's a couple of things to diagnose in there. So, so one of them is now if, if you're at a huge company, there's always going to be someone who is in the weeds on a tactical channel and you just feed them to the wolves and they just, they're explaining some AdWords channel to the CFO and it, it, yep. it doesn't connect. To me, that's a leadership, that's a failure of leadership, right. which is like, you can't just put some, put the tactician in there to present to the, to the board and, and expect. Right. And so, um, that's right. I think that the number one, the number one cause is usually leadership in that there's not very clear and simple to understand goals for marketing. And in a lot of companies, mm -hmm. You're, there's just a hundred things going on and each team has different goals and different priorities and not everything is aligned. And so like as an employee so long, I hated goal setting, but now as a, as a marketing leader and manager, like it's the most important piece because, you know, ideally that conversation with the CFO, maybe there's some nuance based on the channel, but it's like, Hey, you know, how marketing is working on these two key initiatives this year. Well, here's how this channel fits that. Yeah. It's so often that like, all of a sudden, like marketing is off in the weeds talking about something related to the blog and they actually haven't articulated like how that fits into the broader strategy. And so I think more marketing teams could benefit from very, if, if whenever things feel out of whack, like you should do this, you should do stop, start and continue as a team and, and think about like what's, let's all have this discussion together. 
what are the things because very quickly when you get everyone in a room and you say like what's everyone working on you start to see holy cow i have a team of 30 people and everyone's doing different things no wonder i feel like i need to hire more people like the team is all stretched thin but if we wipe that whole slate clean and we said hey for the next quarter everyone in the team has one goal and that is to blank yep. how will you each use your channel to help serve that goal i think like that's the that's the number one it's got to always it's got to all go back and cascade from like the what is what is marketing what are the very clear goals for marketing and those should all cascade from like the what are the very clear goals for the company so it starts with what are the company goals what are the how does marketing play in drive those company goals and then what are the key objectives for marketing and like that that's like a back to basic discipline that I, I still mess up and still have to go back to because things come up and priorities change and the thing that you talked about last quarter you know, but you have to you have to be able to boil that down like what are the two or three big yep. bullets that marketing is is, yep. is focusing on but the other thing that you mentioned is um as a marketer this is especially as you grow your role as a marketing leader the people that you're presenting to are your customer. This is your, this is your target audience. And so you have to know, like you said, these people are not marketing people. So, well then if I'm presenting to someone who, if I'm presenting the chief product officer or, or somebody on the finance team or somebody in HR or somebody in operations, if I just go in there blind and I just go marketing jargon, babble marketing, like that, that message is not going to land. You have to know who am I presenting to going right. in. This is Eric. Eric's not in marketing. He's going to have no clue about the things that we're doing and why. And so I need to first use this up. Hey, Eric, you know, I'm excited to show you this stuff today. Just want to level set. First, I want to give you a breakdown of like, here, here's what marketing is focused on for the year. These three things. Like you have to be able to always level set and always understand the context. Just like what makes you a great marketer, you have to understand who you're trying to get this message to. The same is true internally. You got to present. I see this all the time. People are like, I... We did so and so, th you know, we did all this stuff for the sales team and nobody ever, wa nobody ever watches the videos. Sales team is too busy. Well, is it the sales team is too busy? The sales team yep. is always going to be too busy. Is it that they're too busy or that you haven't like yep. actually figured out the channel that they're going to digest and what they want and really have a deep understanding of them. And so if you want to get better at presenting and sharing internal information, get outside of your marketing world and think about who am I sharing this update with and what are they going to care about? It, yeah, that what are they going to care about? Like, why should they care? What, why should it be important? Right? What, how is it going to make their life better? Right? How is it going to help them hit their number? Right? Then they all of a sudden they start perking up. Yeah, right? and, and also like I <laughs> so, think yeah, I the like, power yeah. of um, same way through through marketing, but like the power of advocates. And so like, if you're specifically trying to like improve adoption of something among the sales org, before I go and try to roll this out to a hundred sales reps, I want to let's say it's like a new deck or something, right? Cause we always love decks. Um, I'm going to sit down with, I'm going to ask two or three of the top sales reps or whoever sales reps that I know. And I'm going to work on this in a much smaller group with them. And I'm going to first get feedback from them and tweak it with them and get them bought in. Because then when I go to roll it out with the broader team, I already have other salespeople on, on board with me and Hey, this has helped me here. Like you, you need to build advocates. Um, uh, of the same kind, right? Like, so, so the more you can get one or two sales reps or, or, or whoever you're working on a project with engineering, could you get one or two engineers involved with you? And, and you know, I think it's anytime you can get an, an earlier adopter and turn them into a champion, it's the same, same way that we talk about like customer acquisition and, 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 and marketing as a, as a whole, the same thing applies internally. Yeah. So the, the story piece of it, I think just as much as the story is, you know, the sort of the great equalizer can also be real data that actually, and, and like true customer insights that are actually helping you tell the story, right? Using examples. You like to talk about that, right? Just use examples and examples. And, and, and I think that can come in the form of data that can come in the form of testimonials and third-party credibility. And, you know, like, you know, you can go down the list. I think the, the thing that I kind of look at is when I'm thinking about communicating a line, like trying to get alignment, trying to get buy-in with either a sales leader, or I'm trying to get buy-in with somebody who, again, I, I keep thinking the CFO and, you know, a lot of the time it is really understanding like what's driving the campaigns that I'm running all the way through to 
you know, something that they care about. Right. And that's usually pretty far down into the funnel, you know, if not all the way at the end. And, and I think, you know, there's a, there's a challenge with that too, you know, as we sort of in the middle, like we're all really fascinated with, you know, as marketers, like I, I, you know, we, we like to throw things against the wall, you know, signing up for tools and, you know, things that, you know, we're trying to, whatever the next big flashy things we like to sign up for things, right. That's, you know, we, we like to call it testing, but that's really what it is. We just like flashy things. And, and that's really not the solution, right. Ultimately. And we get ourselves into trouble. I, I think when we, we try to be so reliant on the tool without understanding what the objective is and, and really understanding what the core need for the, you know, for the, uh, uh, the solution is. And I, and I think there's a, you know, and I guess this sort of segues into the question, which is how do you determine whether or not something is like useful for you like to invest in and as a, as a marketing um, person that could be, yeah, as a marketing leader, right. Let's say, let's say you're director level or above, right. As a marketing leader, like how do you just, how do you determine that FOMO? Just see what everybody else is doing and then fear like we're not, we're not using No. Um, I don't know. It, it, it depends. I think uh, I, I partially agree with you about shiny new things, but I also feel like uh, technology can be used to an advantage and uh, to your advantage. And so, but, but I do think it, it starts with like, um, what, it, what's the problem that we're trying to solve? And then like, could technology be one of those things? And then like, let's come up with a plan to evaluate different things that we think might, uh, might solve this problem. So for me, yeah. as a marketing leader, uh, I used to care about like how the, basically what I learned is that nobody cares how you get the job done. And I don't mean like do, do bad things. I just mean like a, whether you use this tool or that tool or use HubSpot or Marketo or use MailChimp or Constant Contact or use Privy or Clavio or whatever, no matter what you're using, uh, the CFO doesn't care. The CEO doesn't care. They want you to hit, they want you to hit, hit the number. And so whether you hire people, agency, tools, just technology, don't care. Hire, hire one piece of software and have them do yep. the whole thing. They really don't care. And so first is like take a step back and say, hold on. As the marketing leader, I have different resources to do my job, which is to achieve this goal. People, technology, usually, right? Unless there's a third, th third thing that I can think of. And so um, I think you have to be thinking about it. But there's also a, there's also a you know, there's also like a, a, a cost and, t and time thing that goes into it. And so, um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if there's a, I don't know if there's a, there's a perfect answer, but I think of like, I think that the best marketing leaders today are putting technology first and they are thinking about how they can use, how they can solve business challenges, um, through, through technology and not always having to hire 10 people to go do that. But I think where, where a lot of people get broken up on that is, having some big implementation process like can you can you break things down and i'm just a big believer in like is there a way we can test this test into this before writing a line of code or before building an integration or before buying this thing and so my bias is to just kind of be very scrappy and see the things that we can hack together and do ourselves and just get a little bit uh data before um, we go and make some we you know we take on some some huge thing but i also think um Yep. This is why like having a peer group of marketers is very important because like I want my team to be coming to me with like, Hey, uh, my friend is, does demand gen at this other company. And she told me that they're using this tool and we could be using this tool. Like I, that's the, that, that stuff, it can be amazing is like, but your, your team needs to, ha you need to have peer groups and other people. And so even, you know, even on the personal level, like I've always tried to have a couple other marketing leaders that I talked to that were like, Hey, what, you know, what are you using for this? How are you testing this? And so it's primarily driven through like team, team need and team making the case, uh, and, and word of mouth and just thinking about, okay, when we have a couple of our big rocks and big challenges for the year, how are we going to go and how are we going to go and attack those? We need to deliver, um, $10 million in new pipeline this year. And one of the big levers that we think we have is to increase the show rate on meetings. Okay, great. What, yeah. how are we going to increase the show rate on meetings? Well, here's three things that we can do people related. Here's three things we can do technology related. 
let's stack rank those and let's go figure out like which, which one of those levers that we're going to be able to pull. Yeah. So I, I, I'm curious, you got what, what you're, you're probably coming up on what? 5,000 members at this point? Uh, yeah. Roughly, yeah. Like, right? oh, it's over, it's over 4,500. Pretty close. There's always at the end of the month, there's always a bunch of churn and then they, and then people come back. And so, but yeah, I think it's right. It's, it, it's, it's in between four and 5,000 right now. Yeah. So I remember, you know, we, you, I would see posts from you. This is over Christmas, uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas. It was that during that time, right? Pre privy. Right. And, um, you were putting out these posts and you were like, can't believe it. Like we're up to 50 members. This is amazing. Patreon. Right. <laughs> and to see, you know, in a couple of years, how sort of vibrant the community has become is really, is really impressive. I think, you know, so now you've got a sort of an interesting business challenge, right? You know, now you're in a situation where you're saying, okay, I'm, I wouldn't say you're out on your own, but like you're, you're doing your own thing. You, mm-hmm. You're the guy, right? You're the, you're, you're building your own strategy. You've got, you know, you're leveraging this community in a way to build off the back of that, right? Like a publisher, you know, would. You're smart. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and, and I'm, and I'm kind of curious, like, how do you, like, how do you think about that going, like, how do you think, and you, you know, I don't, I don't want the playbook, but I'm just kind of curious, like, how do you think about that large, uh, like, you've yep. got a captive audience, right? And there's a time, there's a window where you have this captive audience. And so I'm curious, like, how do you build off of that? Because there's a, there's an excitement that has to come right along with fear all at the same time. And I'm just kind of curious, like how you, yeah, I mean, like fear of just being on my own. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, I mean, you're going to be able to go and get a job somewhere else. Right. (laughs) So it's not like you don't need a safety net. I think it's really more like like you want to make this thing work. And there was probably a very hard conversation that I'm sure you had internally with, you know, your family or whatever, where, where you were saying, you know, I have this great platform. I'm right now I'm back at drift. Right. And now I got to make a decision. Like I made the, I'm potentially faced with this decision. So now you made the decision and you're moving forward. So this becomes right. a platform for you. Right. And, and to be able to, to do things. So I'm just kind of curious, like, yeah, how it's does, a great question. I mean, that? this is like top of mind right now. Kind of, I think you're, you're exactly right. There's a window in time and, uh, I'm trying to think about which direction to go in because, um, I think one of the cool things about building something like this that I'm learned is it, it just constantly evolves. And so, what I launched was uh, this like Patreon, which is just me like kind of privately ranting about marketing. And that was great. And it grew. But then through that, what I learned was like, you know, people don't, it's not just about hearing from me. People are here. I start, you know, now it's clear, like all these people in B2B marketing are here because they want to get better at B2B marketing. And there's not like a resource inside of their company. And so this has now become, it's not, you know, Dave's megaphone to hear him like privately rant about marketing. It's about like, I'm here to get better at my job, regardless of Dave. I might be the one that facilitates it. Yeah. Uh, and I also just, um, I love, I love creating content, but uh, you know, it, it's it's a lot to always have to be the face of the content. And so I'm trying to think of how can I scale content creation. And so I think like the biggest like nugget that I'm around right now is um, how do I shift so much from Dave talking about marketing to I think I have a unique opportunity to really build a a really strong community and platform for modern B2B marketers that is a place that they go to learn about B2B marketing where they don't, they don't get that in school. They don't get it inside their company. Uh, more companies right now are willing to invest in a couple hundred bucks a year to improve, you know, em- employee development and learning. And uh, I did get so many messages now yep. uh, that are not about me. They're about like your, the community has like been a game changer for me in, in my job. And so I'm thinking about, um, how, how can I, how can I scale that? And then ultimately like I have, I have other ambitions and there's other things that I want to do. And so I'm trying to think about like, how can I, you know, unbundle, unbundle like DGMG from, from myself so much. And like, I think now I have the opportunity to 
to really be its own platform as a destination for B2B marketers. And I'm Dave yeah. and I happen to run that and it becomes a business, yeah. but there might be other things that I do. But yep. uh, I also think like there's just value in yeah. w- having distribution and having reach now means also I can, I can make a compelling pitch to others and say, hey, help, yep. help me teach B2B marketing to others and you might you know, uh, get a following for your niche or for the thing that you're doing. And so that's, that's a topic that I'm kind of like circling yeah. around a bit. Um, the fear is more just like, I don't know. It's you have a people, everybody gives you feedback and that's the gift and the curse of it is not everyone's going to like the decision that you make or, or do that. And I think the hardest part about being yeah. in this business <laughs> on my own is, uh, there's not many people to like, there's not a team of things to like, all right, you know what? Even if we screw this up, yep. six of us got this wrong, <laughs> right? It's like, it's like, uh, yeah. And I, and I, 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 I see some of that, yeah. but, but uh, honestly, at the end of the day, uh, it's not, um, it's not a life or death business. It's a opportunity to help people get better at B2B marketing. And I think yep. there's a cool, I think there's a cool yep. little media company that I can build in, in the B2B marketing niche. And that's how I would really sum it up. Yeah. I, I love that. I think, you know, I also think not knowing you, I've only met you, you know, recently, but I, but I think you potentially can be your own worst enemy because now you have more time to think it's about all, it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> right? right. So, so, you know, like, you know, it was different, like it was like, it was a job and then there's, there's this thing on the, you know, not necessarily yeah. on the side, but it's a big thing. Right. And now it's, it's, it's like everything, right. Yeah. Or, well, a good chunk yeah. of things. So. Um, but yeah, that's, I'm, I'm really happy for you. I think it's really cool that, you know, you've been able to build something that resonates with this audience that frankly they need, or, you know, we as a community marketers need, and it's everybody with a job title of, you know, marketer, you know, in some form or fashion. And, And I think that's, you know, that's a, that's an interesting, you know, it's an interesting area in my by the and the reason why I'm fascinated by the question is just because, or the answer is because my past life. Um, yeah. Are mm-hmm. you familiar sure. with marketing Sherpa sure. at all? Back in its heyday. Okay. So I used to run marketing Sherpa, and and and, yeah. and so yeah. that's what we did, right? As we were thinking through, okay, we had these newsletters, and yeah. then, you know, we had like six of them a week, and then you know they were all cut up by lead gen or whatever, and then we'd have events. Obviously, we had our summits that would go across the you know six or eight of them a year, and then we'd have. Uh, the benchmark guides, I'm sure you probably remember those and the handbooks and, um, and I always kind of looked at it like, you know, sort of before me, you know, <laughs> I, I, you know, it's funny. Cool. I, I, <laughs> right? I didn't really, uh, I didn't really make that connection until now, but, um, I've been recently thinking about what would I name DGMG? Like, I'm just trying to come up with a different name and different brand. And, and I start, I was like, oh yeah, remember, Remember marketing because I started thinking like marketing profs. Oh, mar- there's marketing profs and Hanley, right? Then then marketing Sherpa. Yeah, I, I mean you right. you should bring that business back, and yeah. then right now would be the time for it. Yeah. You could crush DGMG. Yeah. Well, I think. Well, I don't have anything to do with that anymore. But yeah, I mean I, the 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 concept behind that, um, and I don't know if you'd ever met Anne Holland, um, but she was brilliant at building. Uh, she came out of like the paid newsletters, paid subscription like era. Right. And, yeah. uh, you know, Bob Bly and, you know, you sort of go down the list. And so, you know, she like just, she worked at Thompson and, you know, a few other companies and really nailed it. Um, and she's sort of that marketer's marketer, uh, and dealt exactly with this kind of sort of dilemma. Like, you know, I want to build something that's like an asset, right. And grow it. And I want to mm-hmm. make sure that it's not necessarily about me, you know, it started out as me and then it kind of grew and, 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 and built out from there. And, and, uh, I learned a lot from her and she just, there's a, um, but I also learned that there's a window, right. You know, and that's, that's part of it too. It's just, you know, uh, creating that. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I think that that's kind of, that's why I left, so, that's why I anyway, left my job because I feel like, I feel like I have a one, I have like a one, I feel like I need to do this in the next year or two. And, um, and yep. yeah, so, yep. so that's kind of like what I'm, that's what cool. I'm, what that's I'm cool, working yeah. on, but it's a, it's, it's a mental, like it's a mentally taxing project because it's like, it could be as big or as small as you want to chip away at it, you know, from like a, it could be 
hire an agency, do yeah. a whole rebrand, do a whole yeah. website, do this whole crazy big big thing, make a huge investment, or it could be like s- slow to chip away at it. And I don't I don't know if there's a right or wrong approach, but um, it's kind of fun and it's kind of I'm enjoying. Uh, like I talk about B2B marketing and that has helped me grow audience, whatever. But, uh, I, I like thinking about the business challenge and thinking about that, you know, how am I going to do that? That, that, that stuff is the fun stuff to me right now. Yeah. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Well, yeah, I appreciate your sort of opening up about that. I think it, you know, it's, it's just watching sort of from the, from the outside in, you know, it's, yeah, it's thanks. just fun to see. So, so I, I yeah, so I think that actually segues pretty well, right? Um, you know, so you are on, I believe, uh, I want to make sure I get the date right. Uh, Tuesday the so 15th. Right. Yes. It's Tuesday the 15th, right? So I, I have printed it. I know this is probably not economic or economically. Yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, ecologically friendly, but I, I printed it yeah. out because I, yeah. I like to hold things in my hand and I like to be able to, you know, and, and, yeah. uh, you know, I see a pile of books in the background too. Uh, so I, I'm kind of curious, like, you know, maybe talk us through really quickly, you know, obviously you didn't turn this thing out overnight. You've been thinking about it over time. You've been building out these chapters. You've been putting thought into it. You know, you're working on this project for a while. Um, what was the rationale behind it? Like both, I think kind of like the practical rationale behind it. And then also maybe like, what's the, what's the thing you're trying to talk about? And maybe that even connects to what we just talked about. Yeah. I mean, um, the platform, no, the the logic behind it. (laughs) So, so I think, um, I've always wanted to write a book of my own and I love marketing and marketing is the thing that I focus on. And, and I kind of had, I don't know. I, I just was always observing people in marketing that had kind of published their own, their own, their own thoughts, their own point of view, their own unique take on things. And I have plenty of those. And, uh, I really wanted to set a, set a goal of, of, uh, of creating a book and mainly because, um, everything is digital now, podcasts, Facebook group, email list. There's just still some, I mean, I have bookshelves, but I love, I love having physical books. And I, uh, I thought that people that were interesting in marketing, I thought it would be so cool to like be able to, you know, kind of codify and put down some of my thinking on marketing at this point in, in life at least and, and, and give it to people. And so, um, and I've kind of had a unique, uh, not traditional playbook for helping companies that I've worked with grow. And I realized that one of them was centered around this idea of, um, really building a brand for the company founder and the CEO and, and, making the marketing function kind of act more like a, a media company like we've talked about and, and, and having a strong presence on social media and uh, doing something like a podcast and having an email list and having a unique point of view and, uh, you know, really becoming a publisher. And I've seen like a lot of marketing teams just kind of go and they just focus sure. on marketing the product and they're, they're, they're blind to like a story that yeah. might be there. And I think we talked about this earlier in the podcast today, but like, I think, as the marketing leader or as a, as the CEO or the founder, you got to look at all the ingredients you have to grow your business through marketing. And I think one of the best ingredients that you have is to build a brand through the founder, because so often the founder of that company has a very unique point of view, a very unique story. And in the case of Drift, I went there and David, the CEO, not only did have a very unique point of view and strong opinions, but he was, uh, he had a, he had an audience. He he was a former chief product officer at HubSpot. Um, him and his co-founder, the co-founder Elias Torres, they had built a couple of companies together before he had built his own audience. And so the first marketing channel that we really like tried at Drift was to elevate his personal brand and to tell the company story through his social media and through his podcast. And that was created a, an unbelievable connection with an early aud- in audience that I haven't seen anywhere else really. And then we did a similar thing at Privy. I was like, man, I should write, yeah. I should write about this because uh, I think a lot of founders still like are sleeping on, on social media or they, they're just thinking about it wrong. And so I wanted to put down my thoughts on like how to actually use, um, marketing as a founder beyond like the traditional funnel demand gen stuff, how to use social media, podcasting, building your email list, how to use those things to your advantage, what to say, what to do as a founder. And, and mainly because the founder, you know, 99% of the time they have some very unique story about why they started the company or, um, you know, or something that happened to them to, in order to start the company. But they're also the person that's uniquely positioned to have something interesting to say, because 
They're the ones in conversations with customers all day, with partners all day, with potential investors all day, in hard conversations about product roadmap and trade-offs. And they're thinking about the future of the industry. Like those are all the best ingredients for social media, not, and I don't mean this in a, in a disrespectful way, not just delegating social media to the 22-year-old intern. That person can do an amazing job on social media, but I think especially in the B2B context, um, people want to hear from the founder, sure. the expert in that industry, and so often it is that founder. And so I wanted to give people like a very actionable playbook to do that, and that's how we got Founder Brand. I love it. I, I think that's so cool. There's there's such a uh, there's such a connection. I think also to like what you yourself are doing and playing this out in your own. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I, I talked know, about in, in the book, I talk about right? like how even and, testing the initial title and concept for this book, I, I've been doing that for over a year in DGMG and like, so, so, mm -hmm. you know, whether the book sells or not, whatever, like, but I feel like it, I feel like at least I know that I've kind of tested some of the content with people and they helped write the title and help come up with the concept. And, um, that was really powerful. But even, even this like example today, yeah. um, I've done three podcast interviews throughout the day from, from my house and my book, my book marketing plan is the last couple of weeks I started talking about the book and on Tuesday, I'm going to email everybody <laughs> in my, in my list and I'm going to po promote it on social yep. media. And it's like, I didn't hire a PR agency. I don't have a marketing person help yep. me, helping me with this because I've built my own audience. I'm able to kind of set my own path yep. as a publisher. And my marketing plan for creating this book is to use the channels that I've built up over the years yep. to hopefully sell some copies of the book, right? Like that's, that's the meta lesson that you pulled out. Yep. Yep. That's right. Yep. Yep. That's right. Yeah. I love it. I think so. You know, there's a million more questions that I would love to ask you. We're gonna have to have you back on the show at some point, but I, but I, yeah, just for everybody who's listening, we'll have this out, you know, pre, uh, you know, within the next day or so the, the, the podcast itself will drop, but the, yeah, Tuesday uh, the 15th and they can get it where Amazon. And if you get it, if you get it on Tuesday, there you go. I think the Kindle version is going to be like 99 cents. So if you're budget conscious, we have that option available. Awesome, man. It's actually supposed to be some marketing. It's supposed to just supposed to be some marketing scheme yeah. to shoot Very up the cool. rankings, I guess. Very so we'll see how it goes. So that's the analytical part of me. And like, I'm thinking, okay, you've got X number of, you know, people in your list. You know, there's the, the podcast roadshow that you're out on, you know. Um, and then you, you sort of piggyback off the back of that with, uh, I, I mean, I, I have no, you know, I have with no, just the, the algorithm. Honestly, so, no so it'll be fun to see. I really man. don't. I, if, if, if a hundred people buy it and it's really meaningful to a hundred people, that would be yeah. awesome. And if more than a hundred people buy it, then, then, then that's great. But, uh, more of just like, I wanted to put, I wanted to put my perspective on this yeah. uh, in a book and give some people tactical advice. And, and I think we did it. So yeah, that's cool. Thank That's you. Appreciate cool. it, Eric. Thanks Dave, for having me. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely.